My friends, what's up? Episode 9 of the Gomaluko Live Q&A show is up next. Yeah, all right, let's, let's do this. What's good fam? Ghazali O'Reilly here. Welcome to episode 9 of the Gomaluko Live Q&A show, a show where we answer questions on indigenous peoples, rights, education, leadership, family, advocacy, and pretty much everything in between. Um, every episode, I bring in a guest to answer your questions. Whilst doing that, I talk with them about their story um, of success and what they had to overcome to, um, to get there. Today, I'm very glad that my guest today, I'm, I'm, I don't know why I'm saying today twice in one sentence, but um, that's okay. Um, I'm so happy that she could spare an hour uh, from her to sign, from her time to sit with me. Mini Degawan uh, uh, Kankanai Igorot from the Korea, Co sorry, Cordillera Peoples, uh, what we, from what we know now as the Philippines, also director of the Indigenous and Traditional Peoples Program at Conservation International. It's funny that um, I've, I've admired Mini uh, on so many levels, mostly uh, also because like, she works as an indigenous rights activist inside a conversation um, uh, organization. Um, but also like, like when I think probably was like UNFCCC that, that at least I started to um, yeah, get to know you, get to see how you were and yeah. Um, um, yeah, very much impressed. I'm, and then again, I'm easily impressed by by people that I um, that are very, very good at, at what they do. Um, so, before we get into like the whole, um, yeah, what you do at Conservation International and who you are, uh, yeah, how long did were you in the climate change thing? Is is climate change something that you very much focus on, or is it also biodiversity, or like, uh, or did you start? In, in a different process? Oh, I started in a different process. Mm. I followed the whole decla declaration process in Geneva and the permanent, the creation of the permanent forum. Once the declaration passed the Commission on Human Rights, that's when I stopped and I thought I finished with international policy work. <laughs> and, and so I went back to, um, an indigenous organization to work, um, seeing how, so I left the negotiations for the General Assembly to others. Mm -hmm. um, after following the whole declaration process, I felt like um, it's time to do something real. So that's why I left the international scene for some time before going back and I was focused more on the CBD. The climate change was really just, um, some events here and there, but I wasn't really following it that much. It's mm -hmm. the CBD that I follow more. And, and to, like, I'm fascinated by the people that have been engaged in the whole decoration process because not not a lot of people. Um, we all obviously we've read the books. People write a lot of books about decoration. Um, what were your um, yeah? Uh, how did you feel like throughout the, the throughout the process? Um, was it um, something that you felt like was it was a um, like a cakewalk or was it like very excruciating? Like how, how should people um, yeah look at that process um, from your point of view? Uh, you have to remember, Ghazali, this was um, the eighties. There were no computers. I mean, there were no laptops, no cell phones. So um, I remember writing statements in the NGO room, typing it, and uh, and. It was, I think for me, I, I, I was pushed into it because I was then uh, with the Cordillera People's Alliance and there was a huge issue in the Philippines. So they wanted me to bring this to the UN and that was when the drafting started. So I felt like I'm just supposed to be here to present our situation. Why are we now looking at commas and all these sentences? So um, there were no capacity building initiatives at the time, so people were went to Geneva, expected to know how it works, and we did. <laughs> we worked. So it was 
empowering in the sense that um, I remember there were no caucuses yet. I think we started it, the Asian caucus, and then um, our friends from Russia and Rodian will remember this. And they said, oh, we want to join the Asia caucus. So they joined the Asia caucus and then eventually the other regions also joined. So that for me was very empowering, learning about the struggles of others. It was difficult, especially because the Asian governments were the most you know, difficult governments. Um, but at the same time, we built relations with some of the governments. I can still remember the guy from Bangladesh, Mr. Kwais. <laughs> and, and you know, when he always took the floor saying there are no indigenous peoples in Bangladesh. But um, through the years, we were able to build relations and understanding. So my big takeaway was that um, conversations where people can express themselves, not in the formal meetings, which of course we always say, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, but mm -hmm. outside the meeting rooms where conversations happened, I think were very helpful. And that's where I also developed this sense of we need to listen more carefully to the other side. And yes, of course, when we go in, we have our position as indigenous peoples, but also listening to what they were saying and then coming back and addressing them. So that's where I really learned the value of listening closely and getting what is it that they are actually trying to say. So mm. um, now I can look at it and say it's a, it was a learning experience more than it was difficult in the sense that it came to a point where we had to go back to Geneva twice a year for the working group and then the um, open-ended working group for the declaration itself. So it was difficult in that sense because it took away valuable time with the communities, but at the same time, it's also um, great to see now that we have a declaration. We never thought we would have a declaration when we started in 84, when the drafting actually started, but yes. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mini, for, for, for um, yeah, obviously for, for your work during the declaration, really much appreciate it. And I think um, a lot of people um, do underestimate the amount of work that has had gone into uh, the, the the declaration, the adoption of it. Uh, they see it. Um, that's what I, when I canvass um, um, the internet. I, I from yeah from indigenous from some indigenous peoples. You, you can see that they see it as something that was given um, by, by the United Nations. But um, testimonies or like stories from the peoples like you like yourselves really highlight that it was a it was a huge fight um from from the working group on indigenous populations which was the lowest of the lowest of the low in the un ladder uh people need to recognize that uh like building up all the way to the general assembly that took uh, th that took a lot of time and effort and sacrifice as well um so um before we go into everything the whole episode um I really much um acknowledge uh, your work and also like the asia caucus as well um, there's too many people, uh, obviously, uh, involved in that. Um, really appreciate you um, yeah, for, for sharing that and your work you've done so far. Uh, many, uh, mostly, like, not no, all the episodes start off with, like, like the, the, the origin story of, of, of many, like the, ep the comical episode one, um, right, so when, when, um, when many came to, came to life. Um, yeah, like, like, can you please um, share a little bit about like like uh, where you grew up, how you were as as a kid, uh, parent, how your parents were, um, so that people uh, have an insight into like um, the mindset of, of many uh, today. Yeah, I was born in a small town, um, Sagada, in Mountain Province. It's a corn, <laughs> coffee growing community with rice, uh, and young kids would be tasked to harvest coffee, go through the whole process of peeling, removing the red <laughs> peel, um, drying it, and then pounding it so that you remove the husk. And then once you have removed the dust, uh, roast it, and then pound it again to that. And we weren't allowed to drink the coffee. So I felt like this is such an injustice. We have to climb the tree, do all of this. And at the end of the day, we only get to smell the coffee. We weren't allowed to drink it. Um, but they always say, you know, uh, because it's an indigenous community and I was privileged to grow up with my grandfather and three aunts, all teachers. So they were teaching me all these 
school things, but they were also teaching why we couldn't drink coffee because we are kids. So um, all of that was um, my appreciation of the age, the different age groups and the knowledge that goes with each group. Uh, they, they couldn't, or we couldn't learn other things until we get to a certain age. So I grew up in that town. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know. Um, when it was, I finished elementary, I got a scholarship to go and study high school in the capital. And it's in high school when you get to learn the other cultural things like uh, planting rice, the whole rice production, um, the dances, the songs, because that's when you're allowed to attend the dances. And I left. So I'm, I'm missing a lot of those cultural things because I was um, sent off to the school in Manila. Um, but at the same time, because I was in this very exclusive school, and we were supposed to be all scientists, I got to also value the fact that there are many different cultures out there. I grew up uh, only learning my traditional language and English, because that was the language of instruction. Mm -hmm. And we were sent off to Manila, and we were expected to learn or to read write and speak in Tagalog and it was something completely alien to me and so there was this double um, discrimination because then they said oh you're an Igorot and there's this uh, miseducation in the Philippines that they say Igorots have tails because of our traditional attire has this thing uh, behind us and they say that's a tail so I always had to fight them and say no we don't have tails you can very well see that I don't have tails and and luckily because we're more or less um, they call us the cream of the crop the scientists so there was less of that but this that was always the first reaction is oh you're an Igorot where your where is your tail and then the other discrimination arose from the fact that we, I couldn't speak Tagalog. Mm -hmm. It was so difficult. And I remember fourth year, the last year, and um, the final exam was to write a reaction paper. And it has to be in Tagalog. And I couldn't do it. I did it in English. And well, I got a good grade for content and fail for <laughs> grammar and everything. But that drove to me the point that um, one, there are a lot of cultures in the Philippines. Two, there's a lot of miseducation. Unfortunately, it's written down in books. So there's a lot of things that we need, we need to do to change that. Um, I was supposed to go back to the Cordillera after high school and continue uh, college there. Um, but I, I don't know why they expected 14 year old people to, or, to understand the contract. So when we entered this high school, we signed a contract saying we have to take a science course. And so um, I was, yeah, I enrolled in the state university to take up biology, supposedly leading to um, medicine. So it was all laid out like, okay, after this, you will go to medicine. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, again, this is the 80s. And there was this big issue in the Cordillera, the Chico Dam was happening and one of the elders was killed. And so there was a lot of protests and elders came down to Manila to file a case and they didn't speak Tagalog. They didn't understand the legal system. So they were looking for translators and they pulled me out and said, can you help? And that's where I think um, my activism began when I started to talking with the Kalinga elders and I am asking, why are you here in Manila? And getting their, their um, concept of what is justice, um, that completely changed my outlook when they said that they were there, they were filing a case against the um, Philippine Constabulary, which killed their elder. And I said, so are you going to get money? Do you want him killed and everything? And their sense of justice was so simple, no. Um, if we receive money, will it, you know, will, will he come back from the dead? No. If he's going, if the, the lieutenant is going to be imprisoned and killed, will it bring back our elder? No. So our, sent, our idea is that the dam that was going to be built will not be built. So that the reason why he died, 
would not happen. And that is justice for us. So that, re that really resonated with me. And I said, Wyatt, what am I doing here in Manila? <laughs> Why don't I go home and, and try to understand this more? And so that's what happened. I got waylaid in my path for medicine and instead went back to the communities, learned from them, and at the same time, um, taught them about the loss that existed. So my long but short life. <laughs> yeah. How was, how, was, um, how was that received when you, um, yeah, when you moved away from, from medicine and everything else go, and going back to, to, the, to, the, um, yeah, like to the community level? Um, how was that received by your family, by your parents? Uh, were they okay with it? Or was it? Did you receive some some um, yeah some some opposition? Oh, my aunts back home were so angry. They were saying, "Oh, what happened? That's why we shouldn't have let you go to yeah. Manila." But my father was very uh, progressive. He said, if, "You know, if this is something that she wants to learn, why not let her learn? And if she wants to go come back and return to medicine, fine, um, as long as she doesn't put herself in danger." Um, let her be. So I think I was also blessed in the sense that I had a father who was willing to let go <laughs> of these uh, preconceived plans and let me um, find my own path. Mm, okay. Well, and, and then how did that, like, so the community level, what did you, um, yeah, what was the mindset that actually that you, um, yeah, brought you back to the community level? And yeah, wanted to like, what was that sense of contribution to you or justice? Maybe that's a better word. Yeah, it, it, it's a, I, I found their sense of justice very different um, because yeah, after four years in Manila and listening to all the lectures, the sense of justice is getting paid or what is it? Uh, reparation or seeing somebody jailed for an X number of times, whereas the justice in the communities was very different, making sure that the community is intact, um, that destruction will not happen. And if by that's why there was a whole debate whether they were really going to file a case. And they were uh, convinced to file a case because it would bring um, attention to their demands. And so that was, you know, they were going to court, but not to <laughs> let the court, um, um, decide what is justice because they mm. have already um, uh, their set idea of what justice and when I went back it, it wasn't to my own community in Sagada but I went to other communities in Kalinga and and this is something big at Zali because um, during those times um, head hunting <laughs> so the, we were warring tribes against each other so it was, I think, the biggest worry of my family is was why is she going to Kalinga? She might end up without a head mm -hmm. because those are our, um, we were warring with them. Um, but that also made me realize that all of these um, tribal boundaries do not matter when there's a bigger problem. And that's what happened. Um, you know, the different tribes came together and decided to, okay, we should stop fighting each other. Let's fight the government because it's the government bringing in the dam. So I saw firsthand how they did this intertribal organizing and unity building. Um, our communities are very strong by themselves internally, but we are much stronger when we start uniting with our neighbors. And this is something for me that I always carry that yes we have a differences because that's also what makes us <laughs> strong is our differences but if we realize that there's a bigger enemy or there's a bigger issue that we want to address and we get together and so that's also one of the big moments for me is that realization that there's no such thing as a Kalinga or a Sagada when all our lands are going to be inundated by a dam. So better get together to stop the dam. And then we can fight after that. Mm. But for as long as the dam is there, we cannot even fight among ourselves. So why not fight the bigger problem? Yeah. And, and was, was that a um, quote unquote agreement um, like to, to, to stop fighting? Was that uh, done? Um, yeah. As in, in a, 
yeah, how would I say it in a Western way, um, quote, uh, like uh, as in like pen to paper, or was that going through a ceremony? Um, because there's there's two different ways of approaching that. How how did that go? Oh, it went through the whole traditional system of peace pact building because these are because they're warring tribes. Obviously, mm. there has to be a system for them to get together, and they have. We have a very uh, well defined way of establishing peace pacts. Um, but before the peace, peace pacts were just between two communities, they managed to expand the peace pact to the whole region. So it's different peoples, and and it it was a long process because like there are different cultural norms in one community and in another. So I don't think that there was actually anything written down where people signed on to, and yet everybody knew the rules. Like you, nobody from the tribe can work in the dam construction, um, the company that was building the dam. Um, if one member of the tribe decides to become a member of the uh, armed forces of the military of the Philippines, they're excluded from the peace pact. So if they die, there will be no tribal wars because they died in executing their duties. So I, yeah, we never actually came up with a written document mm -hmm. where everybody signed, but um, there were rituals like pigs had to be butchered, um, rice wine flew, <laughs> you know, flowed, um, which I think makes it much, much more relevant and stronger than having something written. Because when you do the rituals, you are not just promising to each other, but you are also making the pact with the earth and to your ancestors. So I think that is something that we should always carry, that those practices that involves not just the present or the living, but also the earth, they're much more stronger. Yeah, I thank you so much for for explaining that, Minnie. Because um, I, for, from what I see, is that there, there's this this um, yeah this perspective perception of um, yeah I would say like uh, with all due respect like non-indigenous peoples like when they want to go into um, yeah an a, agreement or in something 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 some partnership with indigenous peoples like they try to approach it from a very Western way. As in, like, all right, um, sign at the dotted line, um, um, and then it's like a give and take kind of thing. Whereas, yeah, we are used to like um, going to ceremony, rituals, and, make, and in, including not just the the uh, the physical, but also the spiritual, and including not only like the people around us, but also the ancestors. So, it it is. Um, thank you so much for answering for for explaining that because it is. Uh, yeah, you, you see that like when, when um, yeah, conservation organizations or, or other types of organizations, when they go to indigenous communities, um, like they go in with that mindset of or like, yeah, all right, piece of paper, let's sign on the dotted line because that way it can be measured legally sound, whereas our ways of doing things are the totally op total opposite, which is more... Um, and I, I would say from, from our perspective, as an Indian perspective, obviously um, more valuable, more profound, um, I, I would say. Um, and much more it, binding because it yeah. binds us, not just us, but also our relations. And I think that's what is missing when we sign the dotted line or we let the chief sign the dotted line. It becomes just the, the chief and the CEO of the other organization. Whereas if it's a community, then it's a whole community that's signing on to something or agreeing to something. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I think uh, from, from my community, I, I remember that one time that I had to, well, not for a project or something, but like it was to uh, sign uh, like a decoration, like, like a for, to also implement the decoration, but on like an indigenous, indigenous level. Um, and one of the, um, one of the elders did not have a, a signature. Um, didn't like, well, like they did not used to it. So, um, the best way actually to, to do it is by, by doing like a fingerprint with, with, right. with, uh, with ink or with, with ink or blood. I can't, I can't remember what it was. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's much more valuable and like, it's more like, uh, it's a better way, um, um, to, to do things with, if you make it culturally sound, uh, the, those, those partnerships, um, how does that, how does, um, let, let, let's um, bring it to like, or um, from yeah, community level 
right now you're in conservation international obviously indian rights activist Bef in between there was this whole a decoration uh um yeah how would i say it? uh mission as in what was ex not excruciating but like it was a very um yeah took a lot of energy time from you um like, like, like take us to um obviously within a couple of minutes obviously we kind of do it um <laughs> I was, otherwise it would take like years of like <laughs> days yeah. um yeah but like how do you how did you progress like how did you evolve as an as an activist i think that that would be interesting from community level decoration and then going to um yeah conservation international right so like i said once the declaration left geneva i decided that okay enough i'm going back um at that time there was another dam being built in the Cordillera. <laughs> so my activism started from a dam and it was successfully stopped. Um, and going back and saying, okay, now I want to work in the community. Another dam was going to be built in another community. And, and so I, again, rejoined, you know, uh, community education, uh, mobilize, uh, mobilizations and so on and so forth. I became a mother. <laughs> Great. So as a mother, I could no longer be on the front lines in the streets. Um, so um, I thought, okay, let me see what are the options available. And so the ILO came up. So yes, from a grassroots organizer, I joined the um, UN as a staff member of the um, ILO as the regional coordinator for the ILO 169 project. So I was mm -hmm. based in Bangkok, and then uh, trying to convince um, Laos, India, and was it Cambodia <laughs> to ratify Convention 169. Obviously, it didn't work. <laughs> and I also realized that, yeah, this is too much of a bureaucracy, and I don't mm. see the point of being there. So I left that. and. Um, Luckily, um, there was this project involving the nine different regions, uh, Cheo culture, how do we call them? <laughs> nine different regions of the indigenous world. So the Indigenous Peoples Network for Change, which was a GEF project that was okay. um, aiming to um, enhance the participation of indigenous peoples in biodiversity conservation. So. I became the coordinator of that project and I was based out of Chiang Mai and so uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand. So that's where my daughter, instead of learning the traditional language of her mother or her father, started learning Thai, which is okay. great, <laughs> which is helpful. <laughs> uh, and at the same time, I think while I was doing this, the uh, declaration got adopted. Um, and it became a declaration. And I said, oh, great. Now maybe this is the time to see how it's actually going to be implemented. And I can't imagine myself working for a government because for implementation, it has to be the government, but I can't imagine myself being in government. So I, I chose the next best thing, which I thought was um, bridging the gap between government and indigenous peoples. And these are conservation organizations because mm -hmm. They're supposed to work very closely with indigenous peoples and with government. So yes, I, I looked at, I joined WWF for three years and then, uh, but that was home based. So maybe it was more difficult to influence the institution when you're not in headquarters. So I then four years ago joined Conservation International, still with the aim of influencing um, conservation organizations to implement the declaration, believing that they have clout with governments as well as relations with indigenous people. So yes, it's, it seems funny <laughs> that from an indigenous rights activist, but I, I still want to see how the declaration gets implemented. And of course, um, actual implementations happen with indigenous peoples, but power imbalances, the reality is that we still do not have access to resources to be able to implement our life plans. And such resources still need to go through intermediary organizations such as conservation organizations. And that's why I am here. Mm. No, um, something that, that triggered me actually when, when you said it, like I cannot imagine myself working for a government. <laughs> 
Um, are you willing to explain that a little bit? As in, like, what, uh, what is it that you dislike, or what experience that you made you, um, yeah, make make that 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 statement or mindset? I think it's two. Um, the reality that the states governments are. Um, especially coming from the Philippines, are really instruments to further oppression or exploitation of yeah. natural resources. So that, um, plus I've seen how communities, indigenous communities, govern themselves. And those governance systems are community-based. And they are very strong at the community. Once they try to expand them into... Um, provincial and then national and then regional, then there are gaps. So I don't want to be in a government <laughs> that uh, will continue um, oppression and exploitation. And even if they are indigenous gover governments, um, I can be a part of the governance at the community level, but at the higher levels, um, there are challenges, which is mm -hmm. why I would rather be outside <laughs> rather than be in the government. It, it, it makes perfect sense, uh, Minnie, um, the, the way, like the, your whole history, I would say, like, uh, and uh, your mindset, it would, it, it would make a lot of sense um, by saying like, like, I cannot see myself working for a government. Um, so like, we, yeah, I really appreciate you take, taking that, that, that stands and that, that mind, mindset. Um, many, as you probably know, there is a community um, that are watching uh, or that are, that are consuming all the, all these contents and interviews. So when I uh, pose them the question, like, all right, do you have any questions for Mini Dagawan? Um, over 50 questions came in. Um, so I had to actually like select them. Um, so um, by all means, people, uh, this is not, um, yeah, uh, like, a, um, like preference or something like you're trying to, trying to um, yeah, pick out questions that can be of value. Um, and should also be a fun for many to answer as well. Um, this is not this is not a regular uh, sixty minutes kind of interview. Uh, this is just a, a fun conversation, like Minnie said, just us having a talk. That that's it. Um, so uh, Minnie, um, let's go to the first question. Uh, what was the hardest thing for you starting in a conservation organization? The language. language. <laughs> yeah. uh, they have a different language. I mean, I would like to believe that I speak English, <laughs> but when you get in there, um, it's, it's also how they always phrase everything. Like um, they are, they know what is best for the world, for earth, mm. and they are bringing this to the communities and they are actually astounded when communities do not get it <laughs> because they are, they are coming from that, uh, position of their scientists so they know what is best for the world so that's what I mean when I say language, language because they always come like we know what the problem is we know what the solution is join us it's it has always been that way that you know um, yes they have moved from um, saying that people are the problem so you exclude them from the earth, mm -hmm. but now they are into that the language of join us. This is the solution. Join us. Why can't it be like let's sit down? What is the solution from both sides? Yeah. But it's still that like we know the solution. Join us. Mm -hmm. So that is my problem, and it's still a problem to this day. <laughs> yeah, and, and coming from an, an indigenous rights activist background. Um, was it hard or easy to bring in something like rights-based language approach? Was that like gibberish to them or um, did you have an, uh, yeah, an easy way of getting, having them to talk about rights, for example, or a rights-based approach? Talking about rights, writing about it, and even going out in the public and saying, we stand by these rights, mm -hmm. was very easy. And they did that actually even before I came in, even before the declaration was passed. Living up to that commitment or living up to the, what the rights are, that is the problem. Mm -hmm. Getting them to write something about you know, uh, respecting traditional knowledge, respecting indigenous people's rights, um, ensuring enabling conditions are in place, 
they get that. They say that perhaps even more eloquently than I can ever do. <laughs> but it's the implementation where the problem is. Mm. Okay. Um, and let, let's talk a little bit about, um, we did obviously a webinar uh, with, uh, with which you co-organized and I had the privilege of, of facilitating a little bit, um, which was t titled um, um, yeah, Decolonizing conser um, Conservation. Uh, what are your observations in, in that? Uh, what made you organize a webinar? And what are the experience? What did you see? And what would you like to see um, in terms of decolonizing, decolonizing uh, conservation? conservation? Yeah, I think the, the conversations around decolonizing conservation is coming to a head. I think more and more conservation organizations are being confronted by indigenous peoples. And thank God, <laughs> our brothers and sisters all over the world are raising their concerns. So um, I think it's a very opportune time to have these conversations. And internally, conservation organizations are also being challenged by their funders to be more mindful of indigenous people's rights. Mm -hmm. And when we say decolonizing conservation, it's this whole thing of, um, them or conservation organization, organization saying, join us, let's conserve the world. Um, when we say decolonize, it's really again flipping the coin and starting from what does the community have? What do they want to have? What are they willing to give up so that what they have will continue to be there for their children? And that is the starting point of any decolonization that should happen is really starting from the level of the community. Let them decide what they want. Um, obviously, there will be communities who will choose mining and who are we to say that they're wrong? Um, we can only provide, you know, um, this, is, this is what happened in this community when they did mining. So providing them all the information available, both pro or against, but making them make the decision. And if they make a mistake, the mistake is for them to make. And it is only tragic if they do not learn from the mistake. And that is where conservation organizations should come in. When communities realize that they made a mistake, conservation organizations should be there to help um, collate the lessons and move. Um, what is happening is that when a community makes a mistake, then the conservation organizations drop them. So there's no learning and there's no correcting the mistake. So mm. I, I, that's, that's the end view that I would like to see in terms of decolonizing conservation. Is, is, that is the, the vision. No, I 100% agree with you. And quite funny, um, I had a, last week. I had a conversation with a um, an NGO, and not not in conservation, but wanted to support indigenous peoples. And the, their question was, um, yeah, they wanted me to give them some some advice. Um, like, well, do, we have all the, these um, we have these programs and these trainings, but like, it's not working on the local level uh, with the communities. And my first answer, question was, well, did you ask them? Did you ask them if they needed these trainings? Like, like the, the problem is, is that like these, like if you want to help indigenous peoples, um, you cannot come up with programs and trainings in a, up in a, in a boardroom. You cannot do that. Like you have to go, go to the community, ask them, sit down with them, ask them questions. And if they like, if they want to bake pancakes, for example, like want to make a capacity building on baking pancakes, that's yeah, what you should do. Yeah. Right, like that is, and I think uh, what you're going to is really much appreciated is that self determination. Like it is um, you know, putting the the right to self determination back to the community, and I think um, yeah. So I think think that that is that is something that that mind mind shift. The what, what you're talking it's, about definitely um, flipping the narrative, have like making it like bottom up instead of like top down in terms of like in, in terms of like conservation, not only conservation but like projects and, and everything else. Um, yeah, very much appreciate your answer. Um, do, do, do. Next question is, um, how do you decide in terms of, yeah, how do you decide which opportunity, opportunity to take and which to pass on? I think this is more in line with conservation opportunities and challenges. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Um, uh when I made the decision on which conservation organization to join, mm. um, 
I looked at what do they have on paper, what is out there, and I also looked at what are the chances of influencing them. So there's a, what do you call it, an analysis <laughs> of um, knowing what they are, what they stand for, and then seeing is there a chance. So, which is why I joined WWF first, <laughs> because they were talking then about uh, forest rights and everything. And, and this is the reality, Ghazali. Conservation organizations have the resources that indigenous organizations do not have. When I was an indigenous activist, I only got to the capitals, uh, you know, where in Jakarta, you know, where the meetings are. So you only get to talk to certain leaders. Mm -hmm. With conservation organizations, both CI and WWF, I was actually able to go to the communities. I've never been so privileged to go to the deepest forests in Kalimantan or even in West Papua in Indonesia. I would never have been able to do that if I continued to be an indigenous activist. So. I realized that if I really want to see how indigenous peoples are working at the community level, this is one way to go. So this was one of the deciding factors why I chose these two organizations, because they have the reach to be able to really go to the community level. They're problematic, <laughs> really. But to be able for an indigenous person like me to, be, to actually go to the community level, that was something very important. So I make my decision based on will it be an opportunity for me to make a change and will it be an opportunity for me to connect mm. with indigenous peoples and so far these are the opportunities that working in conservation organizations have provided. Yeah, do, do you see um, like indigenous peoples or people in, in um, indigenous people in general or in, in communities um, do you see that this happening, um, that people are making choices based on the, the long-term view, or is it more about like the short-term? Like, what do you see in, in that space? I think indigenous communities always look at the long-term, mm -hmm. not just yeah. in the future, but also in the past. Um, there is never a plan that is made at the community level that does not take into account the historical past. And that is, I think, something that we have to remember and I think that we have to enhance uh, because always forward looking makes us susceptible to uh, committing the mistakes that were done in the past. So it's always also important to look back at our history, learn lessons, and more importantly, gain strength from the successes that our ancestors had. And so, um, Outsiders may look at communities as, you know, they're easily bought. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, if, they, if there's a mining company offering jobs and they will say yes. Um, this is primarily because the governance systems and the value systems of communities has eroded because of so many factors. But if we really allow communities and we, we make sure that the enabling conditions are there, um, communities always decide long-term based on the past. So it's unfortunate that more and more what is being highlighted is, um, and we're being judged as being short-sighted, and that's not fair um, mm. because we would not exist today if our ancestors have been very short-sighted. So it's also a challenge to the current generation to really go back to our values. It's, it's when we forget those values that we become short-sighted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much for, for saying that. Um, the question was not out of my own ignorance, by the way, but just like, I know that there's, that there's some people how you look at it very differently. Um, so uh, thank you so much for, 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 for explaining that. Um, any advice for people who want to be of value to indigenous ways of conservation directly. Uh, we talked a little bit about, um, yeah, like giving the power back um, and any advice that you also would, uh, would give? Um, engage conservation organizations. Mm. It's unfortunate that we engage the UN <laughs> and the state, the member states of the UN, but we forget that um, there are also some powerful 
NGOs out there, and we need to engage them. As the way that we have been engage, engaging with member states, we should go directly ask who is the CEO of this um, organization and try to talk to them. The more that indigenous peoples and not just Johnson or myself or the few others who have decided to enter conservation organizations, you don't have to join conservation organizations. Engage them. Um, at first, they will keep quiet, but continuously send them letters, ask for meetings, and present your case. Um, I think if it's happening internally and externally, we can get somewhere. So I challenge everybody, like, don't just engage the member states of the UN. Mm -hmm. Engage those um, institutions that are doing something on the ground. And some of them are more powerful than some states. They have more money than some states and they also wield a lot of influence to states. So let us engage them. Yeah. Uh, and what would you, what would you um, advise to people that want to, in addition to helping uh, or engaging with, with, and I'm talking about like non-Indigenous peoples, for example, they want to uh, engage with Indigenous ways of conservation. They are engaging with uh, conservation organization, but they also want to do like community, like contribute to the community directly. Um, what is your advice to them? Go to the communities, live with the communities. Mm. Um, that's the best way. You can only really, de really do conservation work with communities if you live with them. Um, do not go there for a week and say you know the community. You have to go through a storm with them. If you because that's when you realize that, okay, we may have planted mangroves on this side of the sea, but actually the, sea, the typhoon is coming on this side. So you only learn that if you have actually gone through it. So um, this whole point about solidarity is not just signing a petition letter. It's actually living with them, living through their own experiences. So go to the communities, live with them. Mm -hmm. and. Yeah. when they need their voices to be amplified, serve as a voice for them, but do not take away the voice. Yeah, 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 thank, thank you so much. Yeah, it's per perfect answer. I, I will, could not have said it any better. Um, you're right, let, let, let's do the next question. Um, this differently, let, let, let's, sh let's shifting the, this, the narrative a little bit. I know, I know some people are ruining everything. Is the UN going to damage the experience and the essence of the caucus, so the indigenous caucus, um, I would assume. <laughs> you know, the indigenous caucus is just a reflection of what is happening in the world. And, and again, the UN, because of its very nature, and I always say this, that maybe the UN has also served to um, diminish indigenous values, uh, not only because of the many, many meetings where we have to be, because participation is not just attendance, right? Kesali, you have to really read the documents. And when you do all of this, then you lose your connection with the land. Mm. And that is why I always think that maybe the UN is also helping the erosion of values because now we get so focused on the documents. Um, again, it is up to the indigenous peoples themselves to make a decision on like saying, I will only follow this so that I can go back to the community. I take my hat off to the indigenous activists who continue the process, through, who really go through it because we need that. We cannot leave the discussions to newbies. Um, you need to have newbies come in and, and develop them, but you have to make sure that there is continuity but at the same time, urging those who do this to every now and then go back to the community. We need to always make sure that the connection is there and we do not get lost in the halls of the UN or mm. in the documents. We do not get buried under the documents and making a decision about apostrophes or commas. It's important and I think this is the strength of those who have followed the declaration process is that we were always able to go back to our communities, which is 
less now because there are just so many processes, whereas before it was just the declaration. So I think it is important for those who are engaged in international policy work to make sure that they are able to go back to their communities, not just because you need to go and drink your rice wine and be with your family, but more importantly, to be grounded. Mm. Yeah, so, such 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 a, a good point of view and a, such a good answer. Um, like for for when when I read the question, like I, I immediately also think back, like well, how the caucus like has at least in my eighteen years has developed in a way that um, that, yeah, like how how do you how do you look at it? Um, as in caucus during the, the decoration, how it evolved, evolved. Is it, is, is it something that you, makes you say like, uh oh, or is it something like you're like, oh, well, well, maybe they're, it's, they're doing a very good th- uh, thing. Like, where do you, uh, what are your thoughts on that? It's the caucus is a very important body. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it, it brings us together. I think um, what is missing that was there before, like I said, aside from the constant going back, um, because we also had people who followed the process. And so there was leadership. Um, um, but I think what was important was those leaders of the caucus um, believed in the caucus. And so they always went back and let the caucus speak. I think what is happening now is because there are just so many um, meetings that you have to attend to, and you also are required to submit responses very quickly. We tend to shortcut to make, uh, you know, <laughs> cut the process and, and, and rely on a certain group of people, like, um, what do we call them? Um, working groups. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't get back to the caucus. So um, by committing these shortcuts, we might be falling into the trap of being disconnected from each other. So I think it's it's just a question of, again, reminding everyone that the caucus is the main decision-making body, not the working groups, but the working group should serve the caucus and not the other way around. So it's I think it's just a reminder. I, I don't think that we are at a point where, you know, <laughs> it's all going here mm-hmm. and there, but I think we just need to Boss, and maybe this is the opportunity to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, think is, yeah, I th- I 100% agree with that. Um, that obviously caucus is the decision making body, and I think, yeah, we should um, take more time. Uh, like we all feel that it's we're rushed through everything, um, trying to keep up. Whereas, like it is, um, for example, when you talk about a facilitator working group uh, under UNF Triple C. I, w- I would I would I would advise people to like oh you know what let's let's take our time on things like let's uh, not 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 rush uh, to uh, adhere to the to the timeline or the schedule of the unit triple C but like use it use it uh, time to our advantage and making sure that it works for us and not the other way around um, yeah so thank you so, so much for that I mean I think the very very powerful and very um, very very necessary uh, thought. Um, all right, different, another question. Confidence comes with passion, but some people find me annoying. Oh, sorry for that. Um, how do you cope with that? Uh, what do you do to help people understand that you're just passionate? Have you ever f- had that experience that people found you, found you annoying? Um, and like, how did you deal with it? Um, sometimes I think that by being annoying, we're also effective. <laughs> if, if we annoy governments, then we must be doing right, right? But, 100%. But it's, <laughs> but it's true. Sometimes the passion takes over. And um, and even to this day, when I talk in conservation organs in CI, sometimes I get too passionate and I can see people closing, you know, just blacking out because it comes across as passionate. What I've learned it, to do is pause <laughs> and count one to ten um and this came with age Ghazali. so mm. <laughs> um this i mean 20 years ago i wouldn't even mind i would just go blah but now i'm more mindful and that is something also that is important is to be more sensitive about the temperature in the room how 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 are they getting the message that you're putting across? Are they closing off? If they're closing off, then I would, you know, and um, if there's still interest, 
again talk in a less passionate way but uh, the important thing is for me is to get gauge the temperature count one to ten and breathe sometimes i don't do it <laughs> i still need to be reminded but yes <laughs> mm. how how important is passion in this in this advocacy rights activist work it's very important because we are facing very real problems and um we cannot really disassociate we cannot be not be emotional about it because our brothers and sisters are being killed or they're being arrested here and there their lands are being taken away so we need to be passionate about it um we can't be you know be relaxed in talking about these issues because they are life and death mm -hmm. um, but at the same time we can be more sensitive um, in the way we deliver the message so that um, we get action rather than a reaction of like i'm just annoyed at me all she does is whine so mm -hmm. yeah no, no um and, and also like in terms of um i think that that's a very important thing for with, when it comes to passion as well is that something that you should have already or is it that something that develops um i know that the next generation um has some questions like how do you arrive at your passion how do you know when Yes, this is my passion. It's a self-discovery, a mm. process of self-discovery. And, and I think for the youth these days, there's more challenge because you're bombarded with so many things, technology and everything. So I would suggest, you know, going back to your roots, going back to the community, um, uh, disconnecting from technology maybe for a week just listening to your grandfather grandmother join them in their coffee picking activities go through that whole process um, i'm sure that after you have gone through that process you will have a self-realization on what you want to do mm. and once you have identified what you want to do go for it yeah uh, that's such a good good advice i think there's a lot a lot of youth that will very much appreciate it let's let's do, do one more question um i know you don't have a lot of time left so um let's try to it's very quick <laughs> <laughs> i know i know just oh, 60 minutes it's over before you know it um uh so let's yeah, otherwise like i I'm, I'm i'm sure that we can talk for hours uh like some of like more about this um but i think um that um yeah yeah you, you you don't want to be like folk, like sitting in front of a webcam for the, like, yes. the rest of your afternoon. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, we'll, we'll just limit it to one hour. Um, all right, let's do the final one. Um, with the current conservation model, what are the biggest challenges that you see and who is doing a great job? The biggest challenge that I see is the um, mindset of donors. For mm. as long as donors do not want to give funding directly to indigenous organizations and the indigenous communities and still prefer to go via an intermediary we will always have to work through an intermediary and despite the fact that they are well-meaning conservation organizations have a long way to go to be truly inclusive they are still looking at themselves as um, gatekeepers of conservation rather than looking at communities as the conservationists. So mm. um, for as long as funders do not give funding directly to our communities, that is a big challenge. Who is doing good? Communities. <laughs> <laughs> Indigenous communities, despite mm. the limited funds that they do get, and they are actually propping up the big NGOs. Mm -hmm. Without the work that communities are doing, all these big NGOs will have nothing to report. It is the work that communities are doing that they are um, stepping on. So let's not forget that we have the power. So let us um, advocate for direct access to funding. And we have a lot of examples to show and we can make the case if they are truly inclusive that they should give the funding directly to indigenous communities. No, oh, yeah, definitely 100% funding. To, like, also, like, there's a lot of indigenous communities and peoples that uh, do not, are not eligible for funding. 
because um, they're from developed nations like the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. Um, whereas like the living conditions in the conditions, the circumstances of these indigenous peoples are um, similar, if not worse um, than indigenous peoples in, in, in so-called uh, devel developing countries. So uh, yeah, definitely, definitely very much agree with, with, your, with your point of view on that, Mini. Um, any final thoughts, Mini? Um, something that you really wanted to bring up, but I forgot to ask you, or something that you want people to think about? Um, yeah, just the final 60 seconds. Um, yeah, any, <laughs> anything that, that comes up that you would like to share or resonate with people? Just a reminder that everything is connected. Um, when you are in the triple C negotiations or in the CBD or in the combating deforestation or even in the human rights processes in Geneva, these are all connected and um, little successes in this leads to big inspiration in the other venues. So share your stories of success whether in New York or in Geneva, they matter a lot. So let's share stories, not just of success, also the lessons learned. So mm. uh, learning continues on a daily basis. So thank you, Ghazali, for having me. And I hope I have answered some of your questions or maybe I have more. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much, Minnie, for, for your time. Um, also for your, for your answers. Um, and yeah, like, like we can always like do one more um, somewhere, in, somewhere down the line when, you, when we are, hopefully we can do it in person. That would be much more fun. Um, and have real coffee. In some... <laughs> yes. uh, you do coffee. I, I do tea. I'm not, a, okay. I'm not a big fan of coffee. Um, sorry about that. Um, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you so much for your time and really appreciate um, yeah, everything that you did. Continue to do. And yeah, um, please, please, please keep sharing your story because it's, I think it's very powerful. And um, yeah, thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.